the covid scenario that is happening right now what its impact would be on the profession as such and how telematics uh, is changing the way insurance pricing or the insurance domain is operating and how actuaries can benefit from it to throw light on this entire topic we have dr v hao chu uh, dr v hao chu leads the consulting team at municree which develops and provides solutions to reinsurance clients across asia the consulting team comprises of actuaries data scientists and works closely with underwriters natural catastrophe experts it and other specialists dr v hao started his career in a primary insurance in singapore before moving out uh, into a consulting company in sydney when dr v hao joined municri back in 2017 he headed the uh, headed the enterprise risk management for the apac and uh, mea region which is asia pacific and middle east africa region uh, dr vihao subsequently took on to head the entire consulting role in 2007 2019 so i mean we have a great privilege here uh, to welcome you dr vihao and it's a great privilege for all the participants to get an idea from you of the global uh, consulting uh, profession that is there after that we'll have shashank address the indian concerns that are there over to you dr vihao Thank you, Akash, uh, for the introduction, and thank you, uh, IQS, uh, for the opportunity, and thank you, everyone, for your time today. Actually, um, the topic today is a uh, is a very important one. Uh, just coincidentally, this morning, I uh, presented at the uh, Hong Kong uh, Actuarial Society uh, conference. A very similar topic. Uh, COVID, of course, uh, is impacting everyone around the world. I'm just going to share my screen. So let me know when you can see it. Yeah, uh, we can see the screen now. You can see it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'll just do a very brief introduction. So I know uh, Akash has, has presented uh, already. Um, just a bit of personal uh, background as well. So I I did my undergraduate and uh, PhD studies uh, with Macquarie University in Australia, and uh, since uh, you know after being qualified, some of the key topics I've been interested in are. Mm -hmm. Uh, risk and capital management, uh, consulting. Nowadays, it's a lot about innovation, and of course, leadership. So happy to talk about uh, leadership on 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 how actuaries can be leaders, as as well. Uh, in addition to um, topics, um, I've been in various roles. So I've uh, worked in the university before, as Akash mentioned. I've worked in a primary insurer in consulting, and now in reinsurance. And uh, happy to have also experienced a broad range of practice areas. So not just uh, pricing, but also reserving, risk management, capital, uh, business strategy, uh, of course, reinsurance now and uh, innovation these days. And I feel like uh, it's, it's actually a great privilege uh, to be uh, involved in so many areas because uh, it is important for actuaries to see the big picture. And also how the different you know topics are interconnected. So so again, um, I'll talk about you know, some some of these uh, areas today. I'm going to go through uh, four topics, and uh, first starting with uh, technical pricing and some of the trends. Then how technical pricing leads to commercial pricing. Uh, recent developments in motor telematics, and finally uh, the changing role of the actuary. Happy to take questions as well. So let's make it uh, very interactive and happy to share uh, whatever I can uh, for today's session. Uh, first of all, on the technical pricing and trends, I'm sure you know you have done a lot of uh, statistical uh, you know, uh, studies or actuarial methods. Uh, and sometimes you wonder why it's so important. We learn all these techniques. And I, I must say that uh, increasingly, uh, it is very important for insurers to embrace uh, technical sophistication. Many, many reasons. I can uh, cycle from the uh, top right-hand side. Uh, first of all, is really the, the increasing focus on the uh, underwriting profit. So in the past, uh, a lot of us, we relied on investment income, but nowadays uh, uh, that is going away. 
So really focus on uh, bottom line profit from underwriting, uh, very important. Uh, next is really the advancements in uh, IT and all the cloud infrastructure that has brought us, you know, it's really uh, enables us to uh, now really deploy a, a sophisticated techniques. Uh, in the past, it was very difficult, but now it's possible. Then at the bottom there is really now consumers getting uh, very, very price sensitive. Uh, you have all the aggregators. Uh, I, I believe you have a lot of those in India as well, such as Policy Bazaar, uh, which um, enables uh, competition. So, so which means that uh, every insurer, they need to be very, very precise, very, very sophisticated in order to win over consumers. Uh, then you have disruptive players entering the market, uh, again, increases competition. And here, technical sophistication gives really the, the, the edge. Then you have the, of course, the uh, advancements in modeling techniques, uh, no surprise there. And lastly, the online digital channels, uh, again, means that uh, everything now is online, is public, uh, price comparison can be done. Uh, and, and all of this uh, uh, just raises the importance of pricing. A uh, quick uh, evolution of the pricing landscape, but again, you know, nothing surprising here. I'll say the breakthrough for actuaries really came about when uh, generalized leader models were introduced. Of course, back then it was more a theoretical construct, uh, but then, uh, you know, uh, quite quickly, uh, I think starting from, from the US, uh, the insurers saw the advantages of using GLMs and, and that I think is a, is, is, is a standard practice these days. And of course, now we're talking about all the other new techniques in the machine learning, deep learning, and uh, again, facilitated by all the uh, technology we have these days. I'm going to skim through some of the details. I, I'm just focusing on the headlines. So uh, uh, if you can, you know, uh, Pardon me for that, uh, because I think uh, it's important to just highlight the key message here. Uh, the next one I just want to highlight is um, right now what we are really excited about, uh, the latest development uh, only, I think, uh, came about uh, last year, was what we, what, what we call uh, AutoML, meaning we uh, bring in GLMs to the next level. Um, uh, you know, for those of you who have uh, tried fitting uh, GLMs, uh, you'll see that it's it's a nice um, concept, but uh, there are so many combinations, right? So what factors do you choose? Uh, are they statistically significant? What about interaction effects? Uh, so many, so many choices and decisions to make. And actually, AutoML is the latest development, which helps us uh, uh, make better decisions still using GLMs. So when we speak to insurers uh, globally and also with regulators, uh, because they're very comfortable with GLMs, uh, it appears that uh, for the time being, uh, GLMs are here to stay when it comes to pricing. But yet they could be done better. And here we see AutoML being a very, very good solution. So that's a very quick update. And, uh, and I just want to say that, uh, um, you know, technical pricing is a very nice thing to do. Uh, it seems very elegant and, you know, you could always have a bit of sophistication here and there, you know, some new techniques. However, when it comes to, um, you know, what I'm going to talk about, which is, which is commercial pricing. So meaning the, like the real life, uh, it's not so difficult. Uh, it's not so easy. So, so it is a, indeed a very complex world out there. Uh, you find that your technical models are not so relevant, uh, or it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's quite common to see that um, the, the, the rates which are indicated by your technical models are way higher than what your competitors are charging. That means that uh, you know, the rates have now become useless. And, and then, comes tech commercial pricing, right? So this is where we differentiate technical pricing and commercial pricing these days. Uh, uh, the first statement I want to make is that not all customers are born equal. What I mean is that in an ideal technical scenario, um, you would charge uh, a technical rate to every client. So meaning every client would give you the same uh, profit margin. Uh, in reality, we have cross subsidies. So meaning, uh, here's an illustration, the best 15% of your clients, they will give you pretty much all your profit. 
which is really nice. And and then we have this, uh, you know, the usual, um, you know, uh, 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 decreasing uh, marginal returns, meaning uh, the next bulk of clients, so say 45%, uh, they give you a lot of profit, but less than the first 15%. And then you have some customers you have there which are, who are unprofitable, meaning they are value destroying. But yet uh, in an overall portfolio, you want to have this uh, because uh, you need what we call top line um, premium to cover expenses. And with, without that, uh, you become very small and uneconomical. So, so that is really the commercial reality. We see, uh, be it in moto line of business, health, uh, property, it's quite common to have a mixed picture across clients. Uh, but still, uh, technical pricing is very important. Uh, we still do that. Uh, almost all insurers uh, still, still value technical pricing. And the reason is uh, that it, technical pricing uh, is, provides a benchmark. Uh, it's like a compass for you to assess uh, or to make decisions on commercial pricing. Because uh, without this benchmark, I mean, how would you set your commercial rates, right? So of course, you could rely on uh, what competitors are doing, but you never know what is the real profitability of the customers you are attracting. So, so it's still important to do technical pricing. Um, uh, uh, this is another diagram which uh, enables you to see, okay, uh, uh, the, on the left-hand side, uh, you have uh, the technical rate. So you have a particular nice distribution, but in reality, uh, there's so many, so many uh, complex factors at play. Uh, sometimes for the same risk, you might charge different rates depending on what distribution channel they come through. So, 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 so this is where the, the, the complex uh, world comes in. And definitely not an easy uh, exercise when selling commercial rates. Uh, again, you know, technical pricing is very nice and ele elegant. Uh, when we do commercial pricing, um, uh, uh, many, many frameworks have been built these days to uh, decide how we should deviate from the technical price. But one of it, one of it is what we call uh, impact analysis. Uh, here's a very, very simple example uh, whereby we uh, subdivide the country into different regions. And here we want to see, okay, if we charge different rates from what the technical models are suggesting, what is the overall impact on our loss ratios? And, and here, this is, this is very important because you want to make sure that uh, two factors. So number one, you are not uh, anti-selected against. Uh, this is a, a very common phrase known to actuaries. Uh, we, we want to make sure that uh, uh, the customers coming to us, we have both good and bad customers, not just bad customers. And secondly, we want to have a loss ratio projection, meaning uh, for every dollar of premium we charge, how much claims we are paying to ensure that we remain profitable. So impact analysis is something which uh, we see as very, very important now. It's an additional step to the GLM pricing. But uh, overall, uh, technical sophistication is a long-term journey. Um, uh, first starting with the, what we call the risk models, the technical models, you know, all these GLMs, uh, that's very straightforward, I would say these days. Uh, what insurers are increasing, increasingly doing, like including in India, when we speak to our Indian clients, what they're also interested to do as a next step is what we call uh, demand modeling, meaning for every possible uh, rate or price we charge to our clients, what is the demand? It's almost like a, you know, setting the supply demand curve or the demand curve uh, so that we can optimize profits. So I'm sure that, uh, you know, some of you may have seen this concept in economics, uh, you know, concepts like uh, price elasticity has also been applied to uh, actuarial modeling. And the last step there is really this uh, multi-year projection. Because uh, if you think about a startup insurer uh, wanting to gain market share initially, but uh, having a sustainable portfolio, 
uh, in a few years time. This is where the multi-year projection comes in. Uh, they want to tweak you know, prices and test what is the impact on demand. So this is where all the models also interact. A very, very exciting area as well, uh, price optimization. Uh, this is where the most uh, advanced insurers these days are playing their game. And uh, at the bottom there, I mentioned, you know, impact analysis, scenario testing. So these are all the, you know, the, uh, 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 the tools we use to assess the impact of all these uh, models. So, yeah, so just, just want to, you know, uh, make a point here that uh, uh, now the world has moved uh, beyond this uh, risk modeling and into demand modeling and price optimization. Uh, I just want to say a few words on what is happening now with uh, motor telematics. And uh, for you, for those of you who are not that familiar with this concept, uh, it's really collecting additional data. So if we think about how a motor premium uh, or how a motor risk model looks like, it's usually based on things like uh, 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 your car. So how old is the car? How, you know, uh, how many is it a two wheeler or three wheeler or four wheeler? Um, sometimes, what brand uh, make and model? So, is it a Toyota um, or a Nissan or a Mercedes? Uh, location uh, is important as well. And nowadays, what telematics does is it adds additional uh, factors to the model. Uh, two main factors are mileage, so number of kilometers, and driving behavior. Can imagine that these two can be quite important factors in predicting either uh, claims frequency or claim severity. And here, these are two interesting graphs uh, we derived from the Korean market. Uh, first is the graph of claim frequency and mileage. And here, not surprisingly, um, as you drive more, uh, you tend to get into an accident. Uh, I mean, that's very intuitive. Um, on the right-hand side, that's a bit counterintuitive. So what we're saying is as mileage increases, uh, the average claim size uh, or what we call claim severity also increases. So meaning um, the more you drive, uh, the higher the cost of a claim if it happens. And uh, you know, that link is not immediately clear when we uh, analyze deeper, what we found is that people who drive less uh, tend to be uh, what we call urban drivers. So they're driving around the city, usually uh, low speed. And if a claim does happen, it's a minor claim. So maybe just, uh, you know, some uh, minor rear collision or, you know, hitting a tree. Um, that's why claims tend to be uh, lower. However, if you are a high mileage driver, then you tend to be kind of driving between cities. Uh, you could even be a commercial driver. And here, uh, claim severity tend to be higher because if a claim does happen, uh, most likely it was on the highway uh, with high speed. And uh, of course, uh, that leads to a higher severity. But uh, interesting findings. And it just proves that uh, these additional factors uh, do play a role in enhancing our uh, claim prediction models. Uh, the next one is on driving behavior. So a very, very interesting one as well. So with all the technology these days, we can actually assess uh, how good you are as a driver. So I guess, uh, you know, those of you who, uh, you know, play uh, games uh, on the mobile, uh, for example, um, you know, say, say, say an F1 racing game, uh, at the end of the game, they will give you like a driving safety score as well. So, you know, how often are you hitting another car or how often have you gone off track? Uh, actually, all this happens in real life. Uh, we have all these devices which can actually measure how, uh, you know, good you are as a driver. So things like uh, what we call smooth driving, uh, speed, uh, mobile distraction, fatigue, time of the day. Uh, mobile, mobile distraction is simply how often you use your mobile phone when you drive. Uh, speed is, of course, uh, you know, uh, speeding, so going up, up above the speed limit. Uh, smooth driving is like, um, you know, acceleration and braking. And here you can see that uh, a lot of these factors are indeed correlated to claim frequency. So that's on the uh, y-axis. 
And it just shows that actually uh, all these factors can play a role in enhancing our claim prediction model. So, 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 so this is indeed very insightful. Uh, in the past, uh, if you think about the traditional GLMs and all the factors which go into it, again, you know, uh, type of car, age of car, in some countries we use uh, gender, so male, female, uh, age of the driver. Uh, someone can always uh, argue that, uh, you know, hey, I'm a better driver. So in the UK, for example, the young males are penalized heavily. So, so usually in a traditional model, uh, they pay several times the premiums compared to an older, mature driver. And uh, in the past, uh, insurers couldn't differentiate good and bad young male drivers. But now with telematics, uh, we can because now you are tracking your actual playing behavior. So, 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 so that is indeed a very big leap uh, when it comes to uh, modeling. Um, here are some of the technological options available. Uh, smartphones uh, actually can do a lot of things. Uh, it can uh, track your driving behavior. Um, less precise, I would say, compared to the other hardware devices at the bottom you see there. Uh, right at the bottom is uh, you know, the most uh, advanced one. Uh, a black box device uh, needs to be fitted by a professional. Um, probably not the most popular option these days uh, because, uh, because it's expensive. Uh, some people are sensitive about installing some device in a car. Uh, and uh, I must say that the smartphone option is very, very popular these days. Uh, another reason why telematics is so important. Uh, so here's a graph of uh, uh, mileage data we collected last year when COVID happened and when lockdown happened. Uh, this is a global data, by the way. And not surprisingly, uh, if you just focus on the, the, the orange bars, uh, the mileage dropped all over the world when COVID happened. Uh, that also meant that uh, claim frequency would have dropped, uh, you know, if you refer to the earlier graph, and meaning that um, you know, actuarial models needed to react to that. And for this to happen, you need to have a telematics uh, proposition. So, 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 and, 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 and nowadays when we speak to a uh, primary insurance, pretty much all of them are interested in the use of uh, telematics in their motor products. Uh, the other part uh, which I want to mention uh, with telematics these days is, uh, so, so this is a very busy chart, but what I wanted to say is that uh, if you refer to the, the right-hand side, it's not just better modeling, of course, that's always nice from an actuarial perspective. Um, what telematics also brings is uh, what we call better risk selection. So I talked about anti-selection previously. Uh, this is the opposite. So better risk selection, meaning you attract customers who are better drivers, who drive less, uh, who are very happy to share their data with you. And that gives you a better portfolio. The second one is a behavioral improvement. So what we have seen in uh, studies done ar around the world is that once you know that your data is being shared with the insurer, uh, you're being in a way tracked, you suddenly drive better. So uh, some uh, uh, insurers actually offer rewards. They have a good rewards program if you drive better. And that also leads to improved loyalty, which is the third point. Uh, the fourth point there, uh, still an area of development is around uh, claims automation. So what I mean is that, uh, again, if you imagine, uh, if we know precisely how you're driving uh, in real time, then if a crash happens, actually, uh, the insurer will know about it. Uh, they can notify your loved ones, they can lodge a claim, they can call an ambulance, uh, and that really improves the claims process. So, so, so big benefit uh, from telematics. And lastly, um, just to conclude uh, before you know, we get into uh, some discussion here is the role of the actuary in all of these uh, developments. And over the years, uh, I have some personal observations as well. Um, what I must say, uh, the headline there is uh, actuaries have become uh, trusted advisors over the years. So this didn't happen you know, just within a few years. This, this really happened over decades. 
and uh, we are trusted not over um, not only for the high quality of our you know of our statistical work and our modeling but our broad knowledge of the industry trends uh, trends risks and insights so so which is no surprise that uh, actuaries have actually uh, taken on a huge spectrum of roles and uh, a lot of them have actually uh, taken on senior management roles so so no no surprise here because they are you know they have such a broad knowledge and um, you know well respected by the whole industry uh, again not being just uh, highly skilled and knowledgeable but also uh, uh, being very versatile and adapting to trends and uh, I would just like to point you to the bottom uh, you know the two figures there if I look at the you know the practice areas for actuaries in the past uh, it was really focused um, previously on pricing and reserving uh, be it in life insurance or non-life insurance but these days actuaries have now taken on uh, roles in all various practice areas. So be it risk management, uh, capital management, uh, climate change is, uh, I mean, actuaries are becoming very, very active as well. Uh, cyber also, we do see uh, some actuaries uh, uh, dedicated just to cyber and pricing and assessing cyber risk. Uh, data science also. Um, uh, so actuaries uh, turning into data scientists, uh, that's, that's very common as well. And, and the last thing there is uh, innovation. So, so uh, actuaries are again well known to be very versatile and a lot of them have gotten into the innovation space. And in fact, uh, quite interestingly, uh, some uh, insure tech firms, they employ uh, chief actuaries. Uh, and they can see again uh, the importance of actuaries. Uh, they, 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 they also want to you know, tell their clients, which are insurance companies that, hey, actually, uh, we also know uh, what actuaries can do. And here we have a chief actuary, even in an insure tech firm. If I look at the industries, so uh, actuaries are no longer limited to working in the insurance space. Uh, many of them now work in banks, uh, investment companies, uh, energy companies, airlines as well, and also uh, even technology. So I mentioned that, uh, you know, tech firms, they hire chief actuaries, and that's, that's really not a surprise to us. Uh, the last comment I want to make is, uh, again, so modeling, of course, is very important. And that is really the foundation of our knowledge. But also, it's important uh, at a later stage to move on and develop what we call domain knowledge, meaning uh, deep knowledge of the insurance industry, for example, the trends, the insights, and, and, and that really uh, enables uh, all of us to be uh, better actually. So it's really just, uh, um, you know, not just the algorithms, but also the domain knowledge. Um, with that, I'll say a few words uh, uh, about the Global Consulting Unit at Munich Re. So Akash did a very good introduction. Um, so Munich Re, we are, uh, as you know, a, a global reinsurer. So one of the biggest uh, reinsurers worldwide. And with that, we have a lot of hubs. Uh, set up all across the world, uh, uh, dedicated to innovation and analytics and consulting. Uh, I'm based in Singapore, uh, but we also have uh, offices everywhere. And uh, for example, Shashang uh, is, uh, is 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 you know in, in our Mumbai office. And uh, within uh, my team, uh, we uh, uh, work a lot with uh, our clients. Uh, could be insurance companies, could be platforms, a lot of digital companies these days to help them uh, improve their business. It could be pricing, but it could also be uh, product development and innovation. And with that, I end my presentation and my sharing and I'm uh, very happy to take uh, questions. Thanks a lot, Dr. Vihao. That, that was... Uh... Quite, quite an interesting presentation. I actually, when I was going through and when I saw that, uh, I mean, we could collect data on uh, mobile behavior and driving behavior. I, I felt premiums in India would shoot up. Indians have a very bad, <laughs> a very bad driving habit. <laughs> so there were a couple of questions okay. Uh, okay. specifically, uh, and I think to the same things only. Uh, 
how do you measure mobile uh, distraction or tiredness and how do we get data on all, all, all of these things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's not a surprise that the mobile phones are collect everything we do so 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 um you know even on you know what we do on the on the other uh, apps so in terms of mobile distraction um it's quite straightforward so 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 there's this you know app you know installed on your phone uh, even Minigree, we have our own app as well and it kind of knows uh, if you are you know calling someone else or or you know playing with another app uh, while driving and here we can compute a score uh, you know usually from 0 to 100 to assess uh, your level of mobile distraction uh, with regards to fatigue uh, um, uh, it's, it's simply how how long how far and the time of the day you are driving so again the mobile app um, you know think of um, say google right so it knows your gps location uh, it knows that you have you are you are driving so based on you know all the you know the points uh, we usually collect a gps uh, point every second so we know you are driving and if you look like you have been driving for say you know two hours three hours in the middle of the night then you know that's like fatigue then again a score from zero to 100 is is computed cool apps can invade a lot of stuff and collect a lot of data <laughs> yeah just be careful of that. <laughs> it does collect a lot, a lot of data great so uh, i have some specific questions that have also come but uh, uh, i let shashank uh, present himself out and then we discuss the questions with both of you all so uh, uh, so guys, uh, we also have Shashank here. So Shashank happens to be an engineer by qualification who loves number crunching, which got him to the world of actual science. He has uh, over nine years of experience in the reinsurance industry. He joined Munich Re in 2019 as a manager actual manager with the responsibility of pricing primary insurance and RI products in the agricultural domain. So guys, this is also something new, which I, I feel a lot of you might have a basic knowledge of, but would not be knowing major of, which is agricultural insurance. He also is associated with the Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana, which is a pet project of our prime minister since its inception in 2016 and is designing the pricing methodologies of its primary yield based uh, which is currently used by various insurance companies okay so it, it's a very large project uh, pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana currently he underwrites south koreans agro business in munigri prior to this he was involved with gic in various roles including pricing reserving setting up pricing methodologies and consulting with the ministry of agriculture of state and central government on various issues related to PMFBY, which is basically Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bima Yojana. So uh, a very, very niche area of uh, application that uh, Shashank comes with. So over to you, Shashank. Uh, so to start with, like every uh, Indian household, and your parents tell you to do engineering, and after engineering, you started wondering that what you want to do. So that is that was the same thing that happened to me i finished my engineering and didn't know what to do and i worked for a, a, a you know engineering psu for a while and i realized that uh, this is not something what i don't want to do and i left my uh, job which was a government job and then i started working with a consultancy uh, which uh, does uh, self funded health insurance for organizations so uh, that was to actually consult them what are their needs and requirements and how uh, you can you make a pool so that uh, you can do a self-funded health insurance after that I joined GIC so it's uh, been a great journey and uh, I got uh, several opportunities one of the opportunities was that I started working on Pradhan Mantri Fasal Bhima Yojana when it was starting and uh, uh, I worked in GIC which was which is also a PSU and uh, they uh, happen to be biggest uh, agriculture reinsurer in the world after PMFBY and uh, so I worked a lot on uh, various things various states uh, various districts uh, administrative uh, things how to put 
things into perspective for different crops there are different type of crops that had been grown at different places so there was a lot of data but uh, you know nobody knew how to uh, 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 there was a lot of confusion in the market that how do we price and how do we put uh, things into perspective and uh, we have seen uh, uh, that the rates of few places which are uh, around 8% to 10% right now used to be 2% and 2.5% and there was losses in the start so uh, my initial job was to make a pricing methodology that will work uh, and that we will give to every client and so that they can price uh, the risk actually uh, which was the requirement uh, put uh, by pradhan mantri fasal bima yojana so the premium should be actually priced so all in all uh, working in agriculture domain for past 5 years and there is lot of there, uh, there are a lot of things which i learned so just wanted to tell everyone that uh, you know don't uh, limit yourself you, uh, you don't want to be just put into a reserving role in a company that you want to do a actuarial role if you get in anything even underwriting is a very good thing so if you uh, so there are, i have seen many posts in which people says that underwriter is uh, you know uh, actuaries are better than underwriters they got a higher salary than underwriter it's not the case good underwriters get even higher salary than they can get higher salaries than actuaries there it's not a thing so if you are into something if you are in sales also if you are client manager whatever you are so actuaries are everywhere in client management in motor underwriting so in india motor our motor underwriter is an actuary and uh, in agriculture i do uh, underwriting job uh, 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 there are lot of actuaries uh, we have in singapore office uh, uh, marine uh, we have head of marine who is an actuary justin so there are lots of roles and you can do anything you want you can start anywhere the important thing is the domain knowledge that comes with it so the one is the actuarial knowledge you know how to put uh, things uh, into numbers but you have to have the domain knowledge what you want to put into the picture so like someone asked how will you uh, you know uh, assess the tiredness you can simply just if you are uh, taking a 8 hours uh, driving instead of 2 hours driving you are more tired so it's just the basic things that you do thanks thanks ashan quite quite an interesting uh, depiction and i think it's a important thing for everyone in the audience to appreciate the fact uh, the diversity the skill set of uh, actually brings and where all uh, it can be applied so uh, i think you you gave a very good uh, let's say synopsis of how how things get uh, how the skill set so it's more so the skill set and which can be applied across domains right. hmm. great so uh, guys uh, you can put in your questions there were certain questions that we had collected so first i will be answering uh, i'll be uh, asking the panel to answer them in case you have you can keep putting up oh, uh, and i will take as and when time permits so uh, the first question I, i think will be to both of you uh, we'll start with dr vihao uh, will data science take over the jobs of actuaries okay <laughs> um good question uh, so i'll say that uh, this will be the case uh, if actuaries stay where we are so if we still focus on you know what shashank said the very traditional work like reserving uh, pricing then increasingly yes uh, you know, data science will automate a lot of things i talked about auto ml already so actually it used to be very well known for like um, you know i know how to pick the best uh, glm i need i can pick whether there's an interaction effect in my model and auto ml is uh, is, is doing a lot, a lot of that then what that means is as actuaries we need to move to the next level right so we need to be now uh, decision makers so how can we use all these new data science techniques to improve my business uh, what are other factors which can be brought into the picture such as telematics and if you can always focus on you know the next areas then i think we do not need to be too worried shashank what would be your perspective on it uh so uh as we have said that if we uh, continue doing what we are doing and we are not going to challenge ourselves some day uh data science will come in they will soup uh, they will automate everything and we will be sitting <laughs> so uh it's the need or 
the hour that we uh, you know go in the uh, direction of data science and it's coming uh, we have a lot of data for everything and to make certain decisions you actually need uh, some models which can only be put in, uh, through data science so that actually is a need of the hour perfect so I, I, I think yeah i mean just to add i mean it's it's not uh, just to put up it's not uh, only the actuarial profession every profession needs to evolve and as, as yeah. i think everyone's reading it uh, it's it's called as the fourth industrial revolution that is happening yeah. which is the data yeah, yeah, 4.0 so it, it's a question that everyone has to update the sooner you update the faster you update the better it is the the more slow you go the more uh, let's say obsolete you become great uh, are there any new prospects that have opened up, especially in COVID-19? Are there any new prospects for uh, actuaries that have opened up? I can name a few. Uh, the one obvious one which comes to my mind is uh, pandemic modeling. So actually, when uh, COVID-19 first happened, uh, a lot of uh, universities, uh, institutions and actuaries as well, they were trying to predict um you know uh, you know this or this curves and you know how the number of of infections and and the number of deaths happening um i think that was uh, easier said than done so a lot of predictions turn out to be wrong but this whole area of uh pandemic modeling has 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 become quite important these days as you can imagine so 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 many many uh, companies even government they are very interested to understand how this uh, pandemic can spread and how we can control a uh, pandemic. So actuaries have also become uh, you know, quite uh, important in this space. Shashank? So as uh, we all said in non-traditional roles uh, that have opened up on pandemic, uh, uh, you know, uh, for pandemic, uh, other thing is uh, companies are now recruiting because they have a lot of stress on their books on health insurance side. So there are companies, there are small companies which are sell which were selling health insurance and they have a lot of pressure on their books because they were very sales driven and now they want to change the prices and uh, you will see in future uh, uh, within three or four months the health insurance price in India will go up. So they are hiring actuaries because there is a lot of data and they have a very small teams and they cannot actually crunch every number. So they are hiring a lot of interns, a lot of on permanent roles uh, to actually quantify uh, what it, uh, how to put a uh, pandemic, this 2019 pandemic into perspective and how to uh, change the premium uh, so that uh, they do not have this huge stress on them in the future. Understood. Understood. Just to put in perspective, the quarter one uh, health claims were equal to the yearly claims. Yeah. So quite a quite a big hit. I, I think that would yeah, be quite a big hit. for uh, life insurance segment in terms of death claims. That correct. Hmm. So uh, and uh, moving on to the next question, and Doctor Vihar, this is an interesting one. So. Uh, how would the data privacy ecosystem uh, look like with telematics? And if someone wants to research in a detail, what would you suggest him? Any any particular magazine, paper, or anything to follow? Because telematics would be wanting a lot of data, which which you highlighted, would which, uh, which the app would be collecting more on a privacy angle that would be there. So so definitely, a uh, data privacy uh, is a concern. And uh, from a technology and you know data processing point of view, a lot of these data have been able to be uh, anonymized actually when it's processed, meaning uh, your data when it's collected and then it's before it's sent to the cloud, actually all the personal details are removed. Uh, and so only things like your GPS coordinates uh, are, are you know sent over and processed. So from a technical standpoint, uh, that has been able to be addressed. Uh, however, from a customer perception point of view, it's still challenging because you know, customers do not think so deeply. So they just feel like, okay, you know, this app is collecting uh, my my data and I, I don't like it because you know, of data privacy reasons. But what insurers have been able to do is to um, market the product differently. So, so if, if you think about it, actually, uh, as consumers, we are sharing a lot of our data 
So, you know, whenever we use Google Maps, for example, uh, we share our GPS coordinates. Um, whenever we want to get driving directions, we share all, all our data. Uh, it's, it's more on how we can turn the insurance product in something which is uh, engaging and useful. If insurers are telling customers that, hey, you know, I want to uh, you know, collect all your data because I want to price you more accurately, then consumers will be very, very uh, averse to it. So it's really about the positioning. Yeah. So uh, I don't know if it, if uh, telematics I think has entered India. I I think Bajaj tried it with the product, but I, it's not been so uh, uh, strongly tested in India as of now. So yeah, uh, it still it has come with time. Yeah, it, it still has. It will, come, it will take some time, but it will come. Uh, actually, we are sharing our data to Google's and Facebooks of the world. We are doing that, and it is targeting us to take our money. So they are getting money, and we are targeting. Uh, as a customer and we are spending more so why not you uh, share your data with insurance company so that your premium will come down mm -hmm. yeah. do it for yourself <laughs> not for anyone else <laughs> so if you are using uh, your car uh, only uh, you know two hours in a day you should pay a lesser premium and they will only know that you uh, should be eligible for that so uh, when they will get your data so uh, you know, uh, that uh, the it's uh, based on marketing, uh, and the time will come when the pay per usage uh, will become a phenomenon in insurance. True. So, uh, there's one more question: Which is the most promising industry in the actual science profession as we are evolving? A tough one. <laughs> I think it's more really your own interest. I mean, um, I mean, I'm I'm not sure the rationale for asking this question. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, it, it it really comes from your interest. Uh, in pick an industry where you feel uh, very passionate about. Um, I think there are so many industries, uh, hiring actuaries these days. Uh, I'm sure the institute also publishes some kind of you know survey. Um, I can uh, give, for example, or. You know, like the Australian uh, Institute of Actuaries, they, they publish a survey saying that uh, actuaries are mostly employed in the general insurance and life insurance industry, not a surprise, uh, followed by the savings industry. Um, I'm not sure about India. I, I guess it's, it would be quite similar. Um, I can't really say, um, you know, one of the most promising industries, it, it, it kind of depends on on what you feel most passionate about. So for me at the moment, it's really about you know, innovation and technology and all these platforms. Okay. Shashank, you, anything in the Indian context that you see? So uh, as I said, go wherever you like, you are passionate about, and you have an aptitude for that. So start with anywhere. There are a lot of things. There are consultancies like Deloitte and KPMG, which works on a lot of projects. They do not have a specialization, but you do different kind of projects. You have Marsh Advisory who do M&A and actuaries are there. Uh, there are, uh, you know, TCS and Infosys who hire uh, for, uh, you know, insured tech background. They uh, hire actuaries to, uh, you know, make softwares for insurance companies. So there are many fields. There are general insurance. There are different line of business. Uh, so in Indian context, I'll say start where you get the opportunity first and then follow your passion because it's very uh, sometimes it's hard to get a job and, and not everybody can, you know, um, have a leverage uh, to sit for two or three years and look for the right opportunity. So just uh, do uh, what, whatever opportunity you get and try to grow and try to change uh, yourself. Uh, uh, learn about your aptitude because ultimately it's about your knowledge rather uh, uh, rather than your programming. No one, nobody, uh, uh, a 21 year old is not going to come and take your job if you are uh, having a lot of uh, you know uh, experience about that field. It's about the knowledge of the specific domain rather than programming. So you don't want to be a programmer. You want to be a person that have the knowledge and that uh, you can convert things, uh, you know, uh, into programs. True. So focus so, on your knowledge. Start wherever you want to. True. And uh, just to add, uh, I think uh, very recently the uh, IFOA, which is the UK Institute, has started an entire or is planning to come up with an entire, uh, let's say, specialization for actuaries in the banking domain. So uh, 
that's one domain that's evolving very fast and has entered into let's say even the textbooks that you will be studying from the conventional insurance that is there so insurance as of now specializations exists for general life and uh, 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 risk management and uh, investments there will be another banking domain that is that is a very big domain that is opening up just to answer this question i mean it's the profession is also appreciating that there is uh, opportunity that is getting available okay uh, so i I'll, i'll come to the last one that i have is what aspects and this is more so uh, as your opinion or uh, on it uh, what aspects uh, should a student think before entering the domain of actuarial science what what should be let's say the check boxes that he should look at Okay, so if it's if you're talking in terms of like a you know personal check box, I think first of all, um, whether you feel passionate about the industry. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, of course, uh, you know even if I look at myself, you know was I passionate about the insurance industry? Um, you know when I first started the course, <laughs> probably probably no. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I guess uh, it it helps by reading up. Reading up a lot, uh, you know, speaking to people, even doing internships help a lot uh, these days. So, for example, in uh, in Singapore, we hire four interns at any point in time. I think it's really good for both parties. Uh, you know, we always love to hear from interns as well, uh, what their perspective is, and you know, what are the latest trends. And interns can also learn from us. Uh, I think that's a really good exchange. Um, the other tick box is, I guess, you know, the kind of the fundamental. Uh, 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 uh uh a uh, uh, criteria of of an actuary so you know do you have uh, you know the the numerical skills uh, the skills around uh, modeling uh, understanding of risk I, i think that's very important because as we all know um, the the journey to become a qualified fellow is 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 tough so so it takes a while and it takes a lot of uh i guess um Uh, endurance, and if you're not interested in the topic, it's very tough to, you know, progress through the exam. So, so I think those are the main boxes I would want to tick. Okay. Shashank, what are the boxes that you ticked after engineering? Um. So, uh, I I gain all of my wisdom from and uh, doing different things. So I started with a. you know engineering psu working as an engineer and uh, i didn't like it a bit and uh, soon i wanted to do mba i gave cat got a good percentile got a good college mda gurgaon uh, did mba for three uh, for uh, one week and i was deeply upset <laughs> uh, and i left that uh, then i started working with consultancy and there i find yeah uh, this is the thing what i want to do uh, numbers are good and i like to have a lot of data and uh, uh, you know get inferences and it's pretty cool to find inferences from data uh, uh, you know you won't realize and after working so, uh, so many years and we all will agree that uh, it's not actually everyone can do so when you have lot of data and you present it uh, you know in num- terms of graph and numbers it's pretty cool so that's what uh, uh, i think and i passed all my papers uh, during work so i started uh, working when i haven't given a set which is the entrance exam so i started working as an actuary when i uh, haven't given a set and uh, i started working for a reinsurer gic uh, when i didn't have uh, any paper uh, cleared so i cleared all my papers there and uh, i stopped it uh, for a while uh, for last two years which i deeply re- regret so uh, you know uh, uh, don't stop to give your paper just uh, you know start at an early, you you all have started and at a very early age so you have a lot of time and you can do it uh, but you should have a passion for that field you should have an aptitude for mathematics you should uh, love uh, data crunching and uh, presenting it perfect perfect I, i i think the entire thing at least uh, what our generation was so uh, i still remember when i planned to start my actuarial career i did it almost after my ca so 
as you did engineering so i also come from a stereotypic background i also did my chartered accountancy because my dad was a chartered accountant and he's like bhai sabko karna hai everyone has to do it <laughs> so i i came from that stereotypic background and after that uh, entered into started liking and then luckily entered in the gi domain in terms of consulting uh, with lots of companies that 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 i got associated with and the entire journey started so guys uh, uh, it's 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 not important that uh, how you do it just keep on doing it and you'll reach the right thing i think someone's yeah. asked here what kind of internships which industry sakshi it's it's focus on the bfsi domain anywhere in the bfsi or consulting domain and uh, you will reach the ultimate destination that is there because shashank gave a very good example you start with underwriting you start with something but you start your knowledge will start building and after that uh, you will be able to make a choice you just to put things into perspective you will find the chief underwriting officer of the biggest indian com- you know private insurance company uh, you know second biggest uh, hdfc argo he is an actuary so he wo- uh, he is the chief underwriting officer he was appointed actuary and he became chief underwriting officer uh, the appointed actuary also looks after agriculture insurance hitin kothari so uh, it's not a, uh, it's about to gain knowledge and it's uh, don't limit yourself to reserving so reserving as you have lot of softwares you have lot of uh, you know people to do reserving uh, just never stop learning and uh, you will find everything is uh, going to be right perfect perfect so uh, with that words uh, i will thank uh, dr vihao and shashank for joining in addressing the students i hope all of you all must have gained a lot of knowledge especially so personally i got a lot of knowledge on telematics and uh now i feel driving in india hopeful will improve because of telematics if not for anything else <laughs> mm-hmm. so it was a great great learning experience for me uh and i hope it was for everyone thanks a lot and thanks we, dr vihao and shashank for giving us the time and uh, we hope to connect for more such sessions for the students and the industry at large thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you for your time thank okay. you thank you everyone thank you, thank you for the Bye-bye. time Bye-bye. Bye-bye.